Aha. Works for me. Oh, great. All right. In that case, I would like to welcome our first speaker of the day, Mark Pollacott from the University of Warwick. And he will be telling us about estimating dynamical quantities, uh, feeling the pressure. Thank you very much. Let me begin by saying it's a great pleasure uh, to, to be speaking. And I'd like to thank the organizers for this uh, opportunity. Um, so the picture you see in front of you uh, is not the University of Warwick, which is somewhat more recent. Uh, this is actually Kenilworth Castle. It's uh, about four miles from the University of Warwick. And I work in Warwick, but I live in Kenilworth, which is a town. And uh, the only thing it's famous for is having this medieval ruined castle, of which the picture is there. My house is a bit more modern, fortunately. But since we're in lockdown, I tend to spend more of my time in Kenilworth than I do actually at the university. Okay, let me see if I can move the slides over. Okay, so what I want to do is to talk about dynamical quantities, numbers associated with dynamical systems. And as a basic principle, you should always look at simpler things rather than look at complicated things. And so I want to look at very simple examples of dynamical systems, mainly just one dimensional things. Um, not because you can't do things in higher dimensions, but simply because it's complicated enough in one dimension to, to get the ideas. Okay, so let's begin with a very, very simple example, which is kind of classical, which is a map of the interval to itself. And this is just going to be the Gauss map, which I have therefore evocatively called G for Gauss map. And so it's a map of the interval to itself, and it's defined in a, a time honored way, which is you take a number between uh, zero and uh, one, and you basically take the reciprocal and take the fractional part. So it's a map of the interval to it itself. Um, and there's some hiccup with what happens at zero, but let's kind of ignore that for the moment or map it to somewhere more innocuous. And so the basic principle is that we now have a map of the interval to itself. And here is the plot of it, more or less. So it's got infinitely many branches. And so between uh, half and one, it just maps into by taking the uh, the reciprocal and subtracting one, and then it just works similarly for all the other branches. And this is a picture of Gauss, of course. Okay, so it's a very, very simple, well-known uh, example of a map of the um, interval to itself. And it also has natural sort of properties. It has a very well-known absolutely continuous invariant measure, uh, which is the, the Gauss measure. So it's equivalent to the usual Lebesgue measure, except it has a density uh, one over one plus uh, X. And the log two there is just to normalize it, to make it a probability measure. So we have a simple map of the interval to itself given by this graph. And we have a very simple uh, invariant uh, measure, kind of familiar one. Uh, and you can ask questions about it. So there, there are natural numbers associated to, to measures um, like the Lyapunov exponent or the entropy or something like that. And in this case, it's very easy to compute it. Uh, so the, the entropy is in fact the same as the Lyapunov exponent in this case, so it's a number. And in the case of the Gauss map, a little calculation reveals that it's equal to pi squared over six times log of two, which is one of my favorite formulas because it involves pi and log of two. And it's kind of cute. So there's a numerical value asso associated to the invariant measure, the natural measure for the Gauss map. So this is all very familiar and happy stuff because it works very well. But you can ask the same thing about other maps of the interval to itself. And so other very simple examples would be, for example, just a, a general map of the interval to itself, which is a, a C2 and expanding. And so the most familiar example, in addition to the Gauss map, is just the usual doubling map. So here you just take um, the interval and you take every point and you simply multiply it by two and take the fractional part, i.e. reduce it mod one. So now we have another familiar example of a, a map of the, the interval uh, to itself. And in this case, we're also in good shape. Here's a nice plot of this. It's easier to draw than for the Gauss map because there's only two branches. And here, of course, Lebesgue measure is preserved and it's a simple calculation that the entropy is log two. So that's two examples. Both familiar examples, uh, the Gauss map and the, and the doubling map. Let's just try one which is a bit more complicated. 
not very complicated, but complicated to analyze. Uh, and that's the so-called Lanford map. Uh, and so this is a map of the interval to itself. And it looks a bit like the doubling map because we have uh, x goes to 2x mod 1. But then we add in this thing here, this extra term. And so it's a kind of like a perturbation. So in the graph on the right, the dotted lines are meant to be the slope two lines that would have come from just x goes to 2x mod 1. And the uh, solid lines are a plot of the graph of this, this, this function, the Lanford map, which indeed was defined by Lanford. Um, Oscar E. Lanford III, who gave you proofs of the Feigenbaum conjectures, but on this occasion, it was a more modest paper in which he was talking about numerical results. Okay, so this map looks, looks fair enough. So we can ask the same question, does it have an absolutely continuous invariant measure? And the answer is yes, but we don't really know what it is. It's, it's going to look like Lebesgue measure up to some density, but we don't know what the density is. There's no explicit expression for this density. Okay, so we can ask, what about the entropy or the Lyapunov exponent for this particular measure and the Lanford map? And in this case, well, the, the formula is you take the um, derivative of the map, this is to get the Lyapunov exponent, you take the derivative of the map, you take the logarithm and you integrate it against the invariant measure. But we don't know what the density is, it's just something, something not so specific. And so in particular, we don't know what the entropy is. It's just some number, but we don't know explicitly what it is. There's no nice formula like there was for the doubling map or the Gauss map. So we have a, a simple dynamical system, but somehow we don't know exactly what values we're gonna get out of it. So this is the um, sort of question we might like to ask if we take this example of a Lanford map, can we actually make some estimates on what this number is, what this entropy is? And the fact that the entropy is equal to this, uh, this integral is what's called the Rockland formula. It's kind of a classical thing. Okay, so that's the, the question. How do we get these numbers? And the answer, what, one answer is we can use what's called the pressure function. What's the pressure function? The pressure function is, as the name suggests, a function. It's a map from the real line to itself. And it contains information about periodic points for the map. So for each of these maps, there are periodic points. Let's skip the Gauss map, just think about the doubling map or the Lanford map. Then for every n, there will be two to the n periodic points, uh, points which are fixed under n iterates of the transformation. So what we do is we look at these two to the n points, and then we sum up a bunch of numbers. And these numbers are just the derivative around the orbit um, for the uh, transformation. And it's just the derivative that you get for the composition of the map around the orbit. And so that gives us a number and it's a function of t. So we raise this to the power minus t. And the pressure is just the growth rate of these numbers as n tends to infinity. So it's a, it's a function of t, which is defined using information on, on, on the transformation. That's the definition of it. We don't really need to know what the defini definition is. We only need to remember the properties of it. And so the properties are that it's a smooth function. It's this red curve in the, in the picture. It's a smooth function. It's monotone decreasing. Um, it's convex. I always get confused between convex and concave, but let's hope it's convex. It's shaped like it is in the graph. Um, and it cuts the, uh, the axis, so uh, at the value 1. So p of uh, 1 is equal to 0. And if we look at the, the slope, of this red curve of this function p of t at the value one, that is where it takes a value zero, then the slope is minus the entropy. So if we want to know what the, um, the, the, the value of the entropy was, for example, for the Lanford map, we'd have to look at the periodic points, look at this pressure function, uh, and then plot this, this thing, and then work out the derivative at the value one. And Bob's your uncle, it tells you the, the value you're interested in. Very, very easy. Um, or alternatively, if we wanted to get a sort of estimate on it without having to work out the derivative, then we can use these properties, but it's convex uh, and it's smooth. And we can actually estimate the, uh, the value of the derivative at the value, uh, should say here, probably where uh, t is equal to one. So when t is equal to one, you get minus, the slope here is minus the entropy. So to estimate it, 
it's sufficient to know what the values are. If we fix an epsilon, we take the value at one minus epsilon and one plus epsilon. And then we can actually write the derivative. We can write bounds on the derivative in terms of this, this simple picture. And the bounds you get, unless I've made the calculation wrong, is that you can say that the, uh, the value you're interested in, which is, this should be maybe entropy here because it's the same value as the, uh, the Apple exponent. So let's say this is H of mu. Well, it'll be bounded above and below using values that we get for the pressure at these two particular points. So the entropy or the Apple exponent for the, uh, for, the, for the Lanford map, for example, even though we don't know exactly what the measure is, we can actually out calculate its um, bound, its uh, entropy, which is equivalent to the Apnoff exponent, just by knowing the values at some nearby points. So that's what I'm saying here. So if you have some trick to figure out what these two values are, then in fact, it's not so difficult to, 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 to bound the, the value we're interested in. And so in particular, you can use ideas from, from thermodynamic formalism, which means operators and some, some minimax stuff. So some, some machinery uh, and it gives you an estimate. And so if you let epsilon be equal to 10 to the minus 178, which seems to be a rather small number, uh, then in fact, you can show that the, the value of this uh, Lyapunov exponent or entropy is equal to what I've written on the screen uh, to uh, basically 126 decimal places. And this was actually proved earlier by Caroline uh, Wormel, who is a uh, finished or finishing uh, graduate student, finished, I think, uh, in Australia. Uh, but she used a rather a large machine, a large computer, and a lot of computing time to, to generate these results. And this does it much more uh, conveniently. It does it in maybe um, half an hour on the same laptop in which I am uh, showing the talk. So the basic idea is that you can, you can um, get the, the numerical value for this, uh, the Apollon exponent, just by estimating the pressure and some little calculus. And then the estimates on the pressure are kind of routine to do using some simple basic thermodynamic stuff, some ergodic theory. But actually I want to talk about um, two different values. So one was uh, a dynamical system where you're interested in the entropy of the invariant measure. But I also wanted to talk about uh, dimension, which is a second kind of important uh, a number that sometimes comes up. And it has some interesting applications to other areas of mathematics, particularly number theory. So let me say a little about that. Um, I see people appearing on this list of um, Midwest young people who don't look like they're from the Midwest or very young, but that's okay. Um, so looking at um, the second problem, let's go back to the Gauss map, the one I defined at the beginning, and it maps the interval to itself, but you could restrict it to some invariant subsets of, of the interval. And so in particular, if I, if I fix the value of n, which is bigger than or equal to two, then I could look at the subset of the unit interval for which the orbit always lies in the interval one over n plus one, up to one. So for example, if I took n to be equal to uh, two, then I'd be looking at orbits for the Gauss map, which always stayed between one third and one. It would be an invariant subset of the unit interval of, of some interest. And the connection with number theory, of course, is that, well, the Gauss map is also called the continued fraction transformation because its orbits give you continued fractions describing um, uh, a particular point whose orbit you are actually calculating. And so if you have um, a situation that you have a point in En, that means that the orbit's always restricted to the interval one over n plus one up to on, uh, up to one. So this is an invariant set of points whose orbits are restricted in some region. Then it means it's precisely the set of points X uh, whose continued fraction expansion, which I've written in this form, has the property that the digits you, you need to write it are just from one up to n. So normally if you have a number in the unit interval, then, and it's irrational, then you'd have to represent it using all possible natural numbers. But in this particular case, because I'm looking at points whose orbits are restricted to some particular set, it means that I only have to look at um, expansions for that point whose use the digits one up to n.
So it's just a different way of thinking of it. So this gives you an invariant subset of the unit uh, interval. And you can ask the natural question, how big are these sets? Well, they're contained inside the unit interval and you want to ask how large they are. Or possibly you might want to ask, what does it mean to say, how large are they? Well, first of all, they actually have zero measure. So asking about their size in terms of, of uh, Lebesgue measure is not so helpful. So instead, it's more natural to talk about their size in terms of their dimension. And so there are various notions of dimension, but I'll take the easiest one, uh, which is called the, the box dimension or Minkowski dimension. So that means I now have a subset of the uh, unit interval. It's actually dynamically defined. It's uh, just a subset which is invariant under this particular Gauss transformation, the natural transformation we know and love. And we want to ask how big it is in terms of the, uh, the box dimension. So what is the box dimension? Well, we, we, we choose a small value epsilon greater than zero. And then we cover the, the set E of N, which is actually turns out to be a Cantor set. We cover it by boxes, or in this case, intervals of size epsilon. So presumably, if you covered it by something like one over epsilon uh, integer part plus one, then you could cover the entire interval and you'd be in good shape. But more generally, you want to choose the smallest number of epsilon intervals you can get away with in order to cover it. And I'll denote that by n of epsilon. So you choose epsilon, it's like the ruler. You're measuring how big these things can be. And you choose the smallest one that you can, you choose the least number of um, intervals you need to cover it um, if they're a size epsilon. And then the game is that the, the uh, dimension, the box dimension, is defined to be uh, the limit as epsilon tends to zero of log of n of epsilon log of one over epsilon. So that's the, it's the rate at which um, n of epsilon grows, this least number, as epsilon tends to, to zero. So it's just a notion of how, how, how large the set is in terms of, of coverings. OK, so we have this invariant set, which is called E of n. I've fixed n for the moment. I have an invariant set for the Gauss map, and I have a notion of what it means to be large or small according to the va this numerical value, the so-called dimension. So far, so good. And so this can also be described in terms of the aforementioned pressure function, except this time around, we want the pressure function to actually depend on the value of n, the value of n which described the invariant subset um, for the Gauss map. So the Gauss map's acting on the unit interval. Within that, we have E of n, which is an invariant set. And we want to describe the size of this. And we're going to use a pressure function, which is related to the set E of n. But it looks pretty much like the previous definition. We look at periodic points. We look at the derivative around the periodic point uh, of the map. The function t creeps in as this exponent up here. And so this is the, the, the definition. The difference is that we're now restricting to those periodic points, uh, which actually lie inside E of n. We don't care about the periodic points, uh, which are somewhere else. We only look at the ones that are inside our particular invariant set. And it's got similar properties to the previous uh, pressure function, um, except the difference here is that, I mean, it's, it's the same, same color, it's still red, uh, the difference here is that before uh, we had a function which um, crossed the axis at the value one, but because we're restricting to a smaller number of periodic points, what happens is that in this case, um, we get that um, where it crosses the axis is actually the value we're interested in, the dimension. So if you want to know the dimension of one of these invariant sets, uh, we can read it off from the pressure function if we knew how to, to, to plot the pressure function as the point where it crosses the, the axis. So it's a numerical value telling you about the size of this invariant set, and, and that's, that's what it is. It can be read off from the pressure function by some trickery. OK, so let's do some examples. So in the case for n is equal to 2, then E of 2 is the set of points whose orbit under the Gauss map always stays between 1 third and 1. Or equivalently, it's a set of points uh, in the unit interval whose continued fraction expansion 
only contains the digits ones and twos. Same thing. And there was an estimate due to um, Good uh, from 1941, who showed that it had these particular bounds. It was known to two decimal places. Uh, this is kind of pre-computer, so it was done by hand. Um, Good is actually a character that he went to work at uh, Bletchley Park uh, on code breaking during the war. And so he's actually a character in the uh, 2016 movie with Benedict Cumberbatch. Um, although he's not played by Benedict Cumberbatch, that was Turing. And so um, Oliver Jenkins and I uh, improved this a bit in a paper in 2018 using some zeta function tricks to understand the pressure. And so we got it up to 100 decimal places. But then a few weeks ago, uh, Polina and I pushed it up to uh, 200 decimal places using a different method, i.e. not a zeta function method, but still analyzing the pressure. So in both cases, um, we're, we're trying to get a handle on, on this particular thing. So this is what happens in the case that n is equal to two. You get a particular invariant set. You can ask how big it is, that's the dimension, and you can happily compute its dimension to as many places as you feel inclined to do. Not many people feel inclined to go to 200 decimal places, but natural enthusiasm carries me there. Or if you take n to be equal to five, for example, then what one can do is the same thing. So e of five is gonna be a slightly bigger invariant set for the Gauss map. Presumably it consists of those points whose orbit under the Gauss map lies in the interval between one sixth and one for all the orbits. Or if you like to think of it in terms of continued fractions, it's the irrational numbers whose expansion has only the digits one, two, three, or five, four or five. It's equivalent, whichever you prefer. And then uh, Oliver, who is a former student of mine, but he may not always confess to it, uh, showed that the uh, dimension of this set was equal to this sort of number, 0 0.8368, some number, up to some particular error. And again, we use the same sort of uh, method we use to do E2. And um, Polina and I have improved this a bit. The previous method wouldn't have done much more than this, but we can improve it using a slightly different method. And so we can compute it to a few more decimal places. Yeah. If you like computing numbers to lots of decimal places, it's very entertaining, but you might reasonably ask, what's the point? You know, it's a number. If you've got the first five decimal places, who cares about the rest? And so that's my question, who does care? Well, because knowing the size of these sets uh, can be used as an application to problems in number theory. And so let me uh, illustrate this with uh, possibly one or possibly two uh, applications, depending on how much time I have and the uh, generosity of the uh, chairperson. And here it goes. So the first application uh, is the following. So we were talking before about continued fractions. So uh, let's think about finite continued fractions. So irrational numbers tend to have infinite continued fractions, but in fact, uh, finite um, continued fractions correspond to rational numbers. So if I take a, a rational number p over q, possibly I want p over q to be between zero and one if I write it in this form, but let's assume we have p over q between zero and one. It's a rational number. I'll always assume that, that uh, it's in reduced form, so p and q are co-prime. And so we can, we can write uh, any uh, such rational as a finite continued fraction, just using digits a1 up to an, n can be quite large, but that depends on what your rational is. And so any rational between zero and one can be written as a finite continued fraction in this form, if we allow the ais to be any natural numbers. And so I know this is true because I looked it up in a book, so it has to be true. Um, and the Zaramba conjecture, which dates from 1972, says that, well, if we put less information in, if we only allow the digits a1, a2 up to an to be between one and five, what kind of rationals do we get? Well, we can't necessarily expect to get all rationals, certainly not true, um, but maybe we can still get all possible denominators. Give up on getting all numerators, maybe we can just get all possible denominators. And so the, the Zaramba conjecture says precisely that. It says that if you have, um, uh, uh, Q, which is going to be a denominator, and for any Q you choose, you could always hope to find a P for which 
that rational can be written as a finite continued fraction. So this dates from 1972. And unfortunately, this conjecture is still open. It hasn't been proved. Um, but there has been some progress. And uh, the, the most famous progress is something called the density one Zaramba conjecture. And it, it says that it may not be known for all denominators Q, but you can find a numerator and a finite uh, expansion using only digits one up to five, but it's true for most denominators in an appropriate sense. And so this, this uh, powerhouse combination of mathematicians, including the, the great uh, Jean Bourguin, the great late Jean Bourguin, uh, showed that the following is true. Well, if we look at the digits between one and some big number, called big Q appropriately, uh, for which it is true, that is we can find a numerator such that uh, P over Q does have an expansion with digits one up to, to N, then the proportion of the values between one and Q, that's why I'm dividing out by Q here, is equal to one. So this ratio tends to one. So this is a, a great result. It was started by Bulgan and Kontorovich, uh, and it was completed by Huang. And so does this have any connection with what I've said before? Well, the answer is yes, because the, the proof of this depends conditionally on the fact that E5, that is a set of points with infinite continued fraction using digits one up to five, has dimension bigger than five over six. And five over six apparently is equal to 0 0.833. So it just squeezes over the line and satisfies this property. So the result is true for this set of digits because of this particular expansion. So I will now look to the, to the chairperson to ask if I can have a couple of more minutes. I'm still in time, I think. You can have about five more minutes. Okay, I, I won't need five minutes. Okay. Un Thanks. Unless I get lost, but hopefully I won't. So, okay, so I've, I've talked about the, the, the benefits of, of using pressure to compute uh, Lyapunov exponents. That's a dynamical application. And here I've talked about uh, computing um, the dimension of some invariant set for a map and how that has applications to problems in, in number theory. So let, let me talk about a, a second application, or in fact, it's a third application, second application to number theory, which is to do with the Lagrange spectrum. So here is um, a famous theorem in number theory, which is Dirichlet's theorem, which says that if you have any irrational number, then you can approximate it by rationals, which is good because they're dense. But in fact, you can approximate it so that P over Q is within one over Q squared. So it's close relative to the denominator. And this is a picture of, uh, of Dirichlet, uh, whose uh, sister-in-law, uh, whose brother-in-law was the uh, composer Mendelssohn, a man of many talents. Um, but if you choose particular values of X, then you can improve on this bound. So for example, if we choose uh, a value X, I'll denote by C of X, how much we can improve it so that x minus p over q is less than one over this value, one over c of x q squared. So c of x is a bit bigger than one. Uh, so in the case of, uh, uh, say, uh, various values, it's known. So the Lagrange spectrum is actually the collection of all the possible values of c of x, these improvements you can look for, where x runs through all the irrationals. And the smallest value for uh, this uh, is actually root five. This is what's called Hurwitz's theorem. So that's in there. And in fact, between, um, yeah, so between uh, root five and three, the set of values you get is countable. And if you go above a certain value, which is uh, 4.5, blah, 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 then in fact, you can get any value C of X. And in between three and this value, it's kind of a mess. There's cantor sets, there's, there's um, intervals, it's very messy. So this is some subset of the real line, uh, which is defined using Diophantine approximation, using some complicated formulas. And there's another object, which is called the Markov spectrum. And so this is another subset of the real line. And this is defined using uh, binary quadratic forms. So here's a binary quadratic form. It depends on X and Y. And you get a bunch of that. So for every one of these binary quadratic forms, you get um, some values, which is just how close you get to zero as you range over the integers. 
complicated looking definition. But the point is that you get another subset of the real line called the Markov spectrum, also defined in number theory, which has the property uh, that it's contained in the real line. And surprisingly, or possibly not, these two subsets of the real line uh, look very similar. In fact, one is contained within the other, but they're not actually equal. And the difference between these sets is actually equal to zero, just two sets. And, and uh, a very natural question is, well, how big is this set of zero measure? So two, new, two subsets of the real line defined by different notions of number theory that are classically studied from uh, 1879 uh, to 80. And the question is, how big is this difference? And so you can ask, how big is the dimension of these things? One should really look at Hausdorff dimension, but since I can't be bothered to include the definition, let's just say dimension in a vague sense. And so we have two subsets and in, in the intervening 135 years, not much has been done, um, but uh, there are ways to, to estimate it. And there's a lower bound due to uh, Mateus and Moreira. And this comes from the fact that this complicated looking set contains a copy of E2 one of the sets I defined earlier. And so in particular, it means that the dimension of this is bigger than the dimension of E of two. These are our, our, our uh, authors here. And in fact, we've already seen therefore that we can get a lower bound on the dimension of this, of the difference of these two complicated sets um, using the fact we have a lower bound of the dimension of, of E of two. And my final slide is to give an upper bound on this difference. So two sets, M and L, Markov and Lagrange spectra, two subsets of real numbers. Um, their difference is going to be a set of zero measure. Its dimension is actually smaller than one. And it was shown by Matthias and, and Moreira uh, that the dimension was smaller than 0 0.9869, blah, 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 blah. So it's pretty close to one. So it's a small set, but not that small. And they conjectured that it was uh, smaller than 0 0.888. So we know this set's going to have bounds between, well, we know it's between 0 0.531, blah, blah, blah. And it's bounded above by 0 0.9869. But we want to squeeze the interval down a bit. And this was their conjecture. And the good news is it's true. In fact, you can get an upper bound, which is actually given by the thing at the bottom. And how do we prove that? Well, we use exactly the same machinery. We use the pressure function, and then we wheel out some machinery using transfer operators and the minimax method and stuff like that. Uh, and it gives us these particular good bounds. And that's a place I would like to stop. Thank you very much. We've got about four minutes for questions. If people would like to try unmuting themselves or typing into the chat. Well, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Hi, how are you doing? Good, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine, thanks. <laughs> um, is there a significance to number five in the Zoremba conjecture? Like if we go more digits or less digits, is it? Yeah, it fails if you if you go down to four. Uh, you can find counterexamples. So if you take um, only four digits, then you can't get the denominator six. Uh, yeah, by some kind of simple, you know, three line calculation. Uh, there's an extraordinarily nice article. It's a bulletin of the American Mathematical Society article by uh, Kontorovich. It's very well written, very entertaining. It's got a funny title. It's called From Apollonius to Zaramba. Kind of a joke. Um, I, I would ha heartily recommend that as an introduction to these sorts of things. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, can I ask a question? Anybody can, please. Uh, yes. So um, could you say a little bit about uh, the proof of Pugin and Kantorovich? Uh, I can say what I understand. That won't take us very long, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot to show the slide. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time. Great. Um, yeah, so 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 you, you may be wondering why they where the dimension estimate comes in, right? Um, or did, did they use like equidistribution or? No, well they, they they do in some sense. Um, so if you're a number theorist, a proper number theorist, not me, but a real number theorist, then one of the standard techniques is to use what's called the circle method. 
Um, oh. so, the, so the circle method was invented by Hardy and Ramanujan and Littlewood and these guys. And it basically revolves around taking some generating function, function of the complex plane, and then integrating around a circle. Mm -hmm. And then to simplify the integral, you break the integral up into what are called major and minor arcs. And then for these different regions you're integrating, you use different techniques. Numbers. Yeah. So, so, one, so near the rationals, which are the major arcs, you use one technique, and near the minor arcs, you use a different technique. And so this estimate on the dimension, I think, comes in in studying the minor arcs. And when you study the major arcs, you have to wheel out machinery of uh, Gambird and uh, Sarnac mm -hmm. and Borgan, which is actually sort of transfer operator stuff, but related to um, uh, discrete groups. I see, I see. So it's still kind of in the direction of uh, six over, uh, I mean, like three over 16 conjecture. Well, yeah, it's the same, same area. They're looking at um, things related to congruent subgroups and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, I mean, they're, they're smart guys and they do very clever things. So my, my understanding is only partial. Thanks. Oh. All right, let's thank Mark again for his talk. And remember, if you have any more questions, you can find him at 1220 in a breakout room to chat with him a bit more. So 